All right, in this lesson, we're going to discuss a medication that, while it isn't specifically used only in critical care, it is a medication that you will use frequently for many different reasons. Therefore, it's an important medication for you to know. With that said, let's go ahead and get started talking about amiodarone. <laughs> All right, you guys, my name is Eddie Watson, and welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage, where my goal is to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making complex critical care topics easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that for you, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. When you do, make sure you hit that bell icon and select all notifications so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. And to test your knowledge at the end of the lesson, head over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link that I'll have down in the lesson description. Check your learning while also being entered into weekly gift card drawings. Also, don't forget that the notes for this lesson, as well as all the others, are available to the YouTube and Patreon members, along with some other great benefits. You can find links to both of those down in the description below. All right, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get in and start talking about what is amiodarone and how it is that it works. So amiodarone is a medication that's been around for many decades. It actually was first discovered in 1961 and it was initially used used for chest pain before it was actually pulled from the market in 1967 due to some of its side effects. In 1974 though, there were uses found for it in the treatment of arrhythmias and it found its way back into the market. Now, amiodarone, commonly called amio, also goes by the trade names pacerone or cordarone, is actually classified as an antiarrhythmic. And when it comes to our antiarrhythmics, we can classify them into one of five different groups. Amio itself is actually classified as a class 3 antiarrhythmic. And so, really, what does that mean for it to be a class 3 antiarrhythmic? Now, this is actually going to be a quick flyover of the pharmacology here, but if you do want to understand this more in depth, then please do watch a previous lesson that I did where I broke all this down in much more detail. I'll link to that up above here. But to illustrate how these medications work, let's actually take a look at the action potential of a cardiac muscle cell, also known as a myocyte. Now, for this example, we're going to be looking at just the myocyte, but amiodarone also impacts the action potential of our cardiac pacemaker cells in a similar fashion. So here we have the action potential along with the flow of ions at different phases of that action potential. The ions flow at different times and impact the action potential in different ways. The ions that we're primarily looking at are sodium, calcium, and potassium. Now the action potential starts with the quick inflow of sodium, then it drops off a little bit and is sustained with the inflow of calcium and then drops back to baseline by the outflow of of potassium. Now our class 3 antiarrhythmics work by blocking or slowing the flow of potassium out of the cell during this repolarization phase. Doing this increases the duration and the refractory phase of both the pacemaker cells and the myocytes. And so this is going to have the effect of slowing the conduction of the SA and AV nodes, as well as prolonging the time in which the myocyte is not going to respond to new electrical impulses. Now, amiodarone is unique in that it does also have effects on sodium, calcium, as well as some beta and alpha adrenergic antagonistic effects, meaning it does also act as a beta blocker. The result of all of this, of having these multiple effects, is that we can slow the rate of our patient's heart rhythm, which can be useful in our tachyarrhythmias, which we are going to discuss further in just a minute here. Now, for amiodarone, there are quite a few side effects that we do want to be aware of. Now, fortunately, most of them are dose-dependent, so the higher the dose and the longer the administration can actually increase these risks here. But amio has been shown to have minimal side effects for short-duration use, which is great. Now, there are many potential side effects, but really I'm just going to cover the major ones here. So the first of these are actually going to be pulmonary toxicity, fibrosis, and ARDS. And here, doses greater than 400 milligrams per day combined with longer durations of administration can lead to this interstitial lung disease. And so what this means is, if possible, we want to try to avoid this medication in patients who do have decreased lung function. Another potential side effect is going to be related to our thyroid function. Now, amio itself is actually structurally similar to the thyroid hormone thyroxine, so T4, as well as it does also contain iodine. 
these can lead to either under or over activity of the thyroid and is somewhat common with prolonged use, particularly in our PO dosage. We can also see cardiac effects of this medication, and so the use of amiodarone can lead to things like bradycardia, hypotension, possible ventricular arrhythmias, as well as asystole. And then the last major side effect that I want to talk about is going to be our hepatotoxicity. So liver function is something that we do want to monitor as amio can be toxic to our patient's liver. All right, so now let's move on and talk about our uses for amiodarone in critical care. And amiodarone can be given either PO, IV push, or as a continuous IV infusion. For this lesson, though, I'm not going to be discussing any of the PO uses or dosing. And speaking of dosing, our dosing for amio can primarily be divided into two groups of uses. The first one is going to be for cardiac arrest. So the use of amiodarone during cardiac arrest is recommended by the American Heart Association during ACLS. Now, important to note is that while amio is a recommendation of the AHA, the evidence for its benefit is really not very strong and questions have been raised about its effectiveness. That said, it is recommended for use in the algorithm for pulseless VTAC and VFib. I'll go ahead and link to a lesson that I previously did covering this ACL algorithm up above, but after defibrillation and after the first dose of epinephrine, we can give 300 milligrams IV push and then follow that up with another 150 milligrams IV push if there's no conversion of the VTAC or VFIP. And for this dose, we're just going to be drawing it up from the vial into the syringe and then just pushing it quickly during the code. All right, now the next group of use for amiodarone is going to be for various arrhythmias. The most common one that you'll encounter will be for atrial fibrillation or AFib. Now, most often it's going to be for new onset, so less than 48 hours AFib, and particularly one with a rapid ventricular rate, so an AFib RVR. And amio has actually been shown to convert about 60 to 70% of these patients back into a normal sinus rhythm. That said, though, amio should not be used in patients who have AFib resulting from Wolf-Parkinson-White or WPW syndrome unless they are unresponsive to all other medications and cardioversion. Now, other arrhythmias that we can use amio for would be things like atrial flutter, stable supraventricular tachycardias, wide complex tachycardia, as well as monomorphic VTAC with a pulse. Now, polymorphic VTAC may actually be worsened by amio, as that one is actually often commonly caused by prolonged QT interval, which the amio is potentially going to make even worse. Now, for our dosing for our arrhythmias, we actually use a combination of a loading IV dose, which is typically going to be 150 milligrams in 100 mLs, given over 10 minutes, followed by a continuous infusion. Don't rapid bolus the loading dose, as you can see profound bradycardia and hypotension if you do so. Now, we follow up that loading dose with our continuous infusion, and the formulation for the bag that we use is going to be 900 milligrams in 500 mLs of D5 water. Now, a 0.22 micron inline filter must be used here because we want to prevent the possible precipitates from reaching the patient. And then with our continuous infusion, we're actually going to start this off at one milligram per minute for the first six hours. Then we're going to transition to 0.5 milligrams per minute for 18 hours. Now, if your patient has no conversion after the 18 hours, the provider may actually elect to keep the infusion going longer. All right, and that was our review of amiodarone, what it is, how it is that it works, some of the effects that you guys want to keep an eye on, as well as the different uses that you're commonly going to see for this medication in the ICU. I really hope that you guys enjoy this lesson. If you did, please go down below and leave me a like on this video. Uh, it really goes a long way to help support this channel, and it lets YouTube know to show this video to other people. If you haven't done so already, make sure and subscribe to the channel down below. And a special shout out for all the YouTube and Patreon members out there, the support that you guys show me for this channel is truly appreciated and I absolutely value you guys. Thank you so much. For the rest of you guys, if you'd be interested in showing support for this channel, as well as getting some additional perks for doing just that, you can find the links to both the YouTube and the Patreon memberships down in the lesson description below. Down there, you'll also find links to some of my favorite books and nursing gear, as well as a couple awesome shirt designs that I have down there as well. Make sure you guys stay tuned for the next lesson I release. Otherwise, in the meantime, check out a couple awesome lessons I'm going to link to right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. You have a a wonderful day.